Welcome to Around Space. I'm Kent Miller. Today we're going to be talking about planetary defense. And by that we mean defense against large objects such as asteroids uh, hitting the Earth. I'm delighted to have with us Dr. Robert Terry. In uh, 1968 he got his, P his bachelor's in physics from MIT. In 79 he got his master's and his PhD in physics from Johns Hopkins. He then joined the Naval Research Lab in 1980 and stayed there until his retirement in 2007. Uh, he is one of the uh, co-founders of the Mars Society uh, and currently he works as a consultant. He is also a member of the Civil Air Patrol. Welcome back to this table. A pleasure to be here. All right. Tell us about what we're defending against. Well, what we're defending against are rocks big and small things that can flatten all the trees inside the area equivalent to the Washington Beltway, which was Tunguska, a mere 108 years ago, or things that can put craters in Arizona. All of these rocks are within the scope of deflection technology if you find them fast enough. So I recently went to a conference called the Planetary Defense Conference in Frascati, Italy. And this is the fourth conference of its kind. It happens every couple of years. The last one is in Flagstaff, Arizona. But I went to Italy because I wanted to bring forward some of the technology and some of the lore about how to do uh, civil defense for an asteroid impact for work with Civil Air Patrol. Uh, we are providers of emergency services. We are part of the incident command response system. And so it's even a natural thing for us to understand how you would change, uh, how would you plan for a meteor impact because the ones you can work with are the ones you're gonna know about. All right. So uh, this so. conference was uh, a, a week of very, very uh, fine uh, material, but we also had a threat response exercise and we'll discuss right, a few of the things about tell that. Tell us about that shortly. I will. All right. Now, uh, tell us maybe about the population of um, objects that can hit the Earth. I know from uh, uh, being outside in, in, on a dark night, I can see little meteorites flashing when they uh, come into the atmosphere. So we got lots of small objects out there. Lots. How about the bigger ones that we're scared of? Well, the bigger ones that we would be most scared of, the, if you look on the second slide here, uh, there's a big arrow down at the bottom for Chicxulub. Oh, and Chicxulub was the dino, dino dinger. Right. Uh, and this killed the dinosaurs. <laughs> ten, ten, uh, uh, ten, 10 kilometers across, okay. uh, uh, 10 to the fifth, uh, 10 to the eighth megatons of energy uh, explosion. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a real uh, extinction level event. Right. Things in that category we know, and we know well enough that they are, uh, they're, they're known known knowns. So, so our astronomers have been able to find all objects of that size. And if you look on the second slide, if you go sort of down in magnitude and, and down in impact energy and down in radius, when you get to about one kilometer radius, there's a red line that sort of stays flat and there's a blue line and a lot of dots going up. And the difference between the red line and the blue line, that's the domain of the known unknowns. That's where we have to find the things that might cause us a problem mm -hmm. two years from now, 10 years from now, 800 years from now, whenever you can lock onto their orbits and, and winkle out enough information, then you can start to think about how you're going to mitigate against these objects. Okay, so the red lines are the ones we know about, we've discovered. Right. As which means we got a, a big gap. Now this is a log scale, right? Yes, it is. Oh dear. It is. So, 
Yeah, up oh. on up on the up on the upper up uh, on the upper left, you say you see Chelyabinsk, and Chelyabinsk is a fraction of a megaton in, in, in an airburst. Mm -hmm. It's about 20, uh, 18 meters in diameter, and it came in at grazing incidence. Had Chelyabinsk come down more normally yeah. to the earth, had it had its flash actually come down, so the the, the flash of its evapor of its radiative loading had gone down to the ground and come out, you could have flattened the town. Mm, yeah. I mean, this was a serious, serious impactor at half a megaton. Yeah. Um, so Chelyabinsk is, sneaks up on us. Chely and, 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 and later in the exercise, you'll see some of the slides. The, the asteroid is, a, is a very much a Chelyabinsky. It's one that slides up on us from out of the sun, uh -huh. down, down because when things are mocked by the sun, you can't find them until they're right up on you, or you can the only times you can see them are those special special points in the orbit. Yeah. So you have to find them and track them, and then the question is, can you go out and put a tag on them? If you can get the thing to, to to phone home every ten minutes, you'll know the orbit really very well. But first, mm. you have to find them. So when, yeah. you, when you look at this chart due to Alan Harris and, uh, it, uh, and updated for this conference. It's the absolute magnitude is going down very, very quickly here. And all the little guys that might be a danger are also very, very hard to see. Right. And so so we've, we've, since it's a log scale, we've only found 1% of them, right? Pretty much. Oh dear, okay. Pretty much. And so there are lots of ongoing surveys. There's uh -huh. Neo Shield. There are several other activities uh, with NASA and in the European community, all focused on trying to find the rascals yeah. and and decide what their orbits are going to be. But uh, matching def deflection techniques to even small rocks is not easy because you still have the problem of this uh, 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 momentum, which is small compared to the momentum it has in orbit. And imagining the deflection techniques on larger rocks is perhaps worse. But we're going to be hit. It's a matter of when, sure. not a matter of if. Well, we're being hit all the time by small, very small objects. Indeed. Right? Yeah. On the chart, if you, if you have really mm -hmm. good eyes and you see a good chart, there's this thing called infrasound. And infrasound has, has, is a matter of actually listening to impacts when things go bang out in the ocean and all these sauna buoys, and they listen to this infrared low frequency sound. Right, this is below what we can hear. So below what we can hear, and yeah. they integrate that sound picture, and from that you can gauge where some of these small impactors, how many small impactors there are. Yeah. And that's what helps fill in this curve on the second slide. Okay. So now, the question is, Mitigation. When, mitigation. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, if you have something on deck that you can put up there, that's fine, but we don't. And, and, and the uh, third slide talks about a, a, a figure from Defending Planet Earth. The National Research Council did a study mm -hmm. about matching mitigations to various techniques in, in this phase space. There's warning time in years, this diameter in meters, which goes right along with the diameter from the previous slide about okay. how much, how big an impact you're going to get, yeah. and so at the top of the at the top of the problem, where we're talking about uh, a ten kilometer diameter and any kind of warning at all, nuclear deflection is about the only option. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you have something in the hundred meter to two hundred meter diameter, and you have five to fifty years to work with it. Kinetic impact is where you just run something up and s smack into it. Okay. And you can deliver enough momentum over time, maybe two or three or four or five or ten, depending on the size, you actually can move this thing. Now, NASA actually did hit one asteroid with a, yes. an impactor. None of the experiments so far have been in the category of actually trying to drill in and provide impact. Some of the experiments of asteroid deflection are being considered. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of work at this conference about identifying good targets for a deflection mission right. to see if you can actually calibrate and understand what happens mm -hmm. when you throw these impactors in there. Right. Because when the impactor comes in, there's a direct momentum, but then when it drills in and it vaporizes, 
there is a jet of gas that comes out of the cavity. So there's a backward cone. Yeah, there's of a, ba there's a back, uh, back yeah. a cone of ejecta, but all this is from essentially the heat of vaporizing right. the, the missile. Mm -hmm. And so there is the there is the momentum transfer, primary momentum transfer, and then there's a secondary momentum transfer because of all this energy is coming at kind of like a little rocket. Right. Okay. And so the ratio between the primary momentum and the momentum coming from the rocket effect is called unimaginatively beta. <laughs> you know, so many betas in physics, but they had to pick, they had chose beta for this thing. There's a lot of argument about beta. All right. Lots of codes are trying to but compute But it's what, three? Beta. Is it two or three or something like that? Some people think it can be as high as seven. Oh, really? Yeah, which is remarkable to me. As a computational physicist, I was very interested in watching all these codes yeah. parade themselves. Uh -huh. uh, and and, I, and it's, it's a very delicate, it's a very delicate calculation. Mm. But anyway, certainly, I, I don't have any problem thinking about three to five for yeah. a beta. Yeah. Uh, when people tell me anything higher than seven, I get a little, I'm, I'm a little <laughs> dubious. But yes. it's it's arguable and is something you can look at. So the nuclear impact is is what you do when you don't do that. We have a kinetic in impact is not going to be enough, and right. in all cases, the nuclear impact wants to stand off, not to actually, not to actually drill, drill the explosive you device in deep. Yeah. Right. Most cases, the nuclear impact wants to stand off and roast it with X-rays. Well, was, uh, if you have a, a one kilovolt to ten kilovolt black body X-ray source or you have a source, copious source of neutrons and you explode this uh, nuclear explosive device, it's no longer a weapon. We've stripped off the, stripped off the reentry shield, so it's okay. no longer a weapon. So it doesn't violate the treaty. And we can send it out there, park it next to the asteroid. Right. But the idea Boom. is the, the energy that's deposited in the surface right. causes an explosive uh, right. evaporation, right. if you wish, of the surface. Right. And so action equals reaction. Right. The, the remaining part gets nudged. Right. So, yes. all right. And so a big enough kick, or maybe several big kicks, depending mm -hmm. on what you're dealing with, is enough to move this thing off. You're talking millimeters, you know, millimeters per second, but you've done it on this huge mass, of course. Right. And it takes time to... Well, and if you have enough years, work. then it adds up. you have up. enough years. Yeah. Now, the, the other, in a, in a little corner to the right, in the lower right of the diagram, you see tractor. Yeah. Now, gravity tractor is imagining where you have a, something in orbit and whenever, whenever your your orbit, your little satellite is orbiting the asteroid, and it comes away in the direction you want to pull it, then you t fire your rocket and you tug on the satellite. Boom! Yeah. And you go around and you tug again. So by fi firing your rocket in phase, you put a, a, a cohesive action onto the satellite, mm -hmm. uh, onto the asteroid, yeah. and over time you tug it away. Okay. Now a lot of things are proposed for tractors. But in many cases, as you can see from the size of this part of the phase space. You need 50 years of time. You need a lot of time, yeah. and there's a very limited number of targets you can work on. And right. the targets you can work mm -hmm. on are going to be small-ish. So they may not, you, you have mm. the problem when they're small, you don't see them in time. Yeah. So you don't have the years. <laughs> so the tractor, the tractor is kind of out in the North Forty. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's not it's, looking very attractive. It's, it's, it's not, not very attractive. <laughs> but tell me about civil defense. Yeah, with well, civil defense is probably going to happen no matter what you do for deflection because we can easily see sometimes the deflections don't work and ultimately you have to have to treat uh, maybe evacuating a large number of people in a short amount of time. Right. Or you have to treat mm -hmm. the problem of how to deal with tsunamis which may be arising from ocean impacts. Right. And uh, a lot of the material at the conference showed us the, the great work that's done from the National Laboratory, Sandia, Livermore, Los Alamos, in actually predicting the impact and mm -hmm. predicting the effects. So we'll see in a, a, little, a little further along, we'll see some of the calculations and how these things rig up and what you can expect. So the, 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 th the primary thing in civil defense is to understand what you can expect from the experts what timing you're going to get and when you can expect it and how fast you may have to change your mind when something like a deflection goes wrong. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so forth like that. Okay. So but within the context of the conference, now the fourth slide okay. is actually a little exercise in how to deflect an asteroid. Okay. We're given an app uh, due to Paul Childress, uh, Childress at JPL and other, other co-workers of his, and we could set up scenarios, and we had our, our standard 
Chelyabinsk threat asteroid, okay. hazard asteroid, which is in the red curve there. And at the lower part, you'll see what looks like the disk. And the outer ring in red is the place where you have to push the asteroid to save the Earth. All right. And between the, in, between the center blue and there is a place where the asteroid will come in at grazing incidents and perhaps be a very high, a strong air burst, but not, uh, not, a, not a burst on the ground. So if it's in the blue disk, it hits the Earth. Yes. And if it's in the, in the ring, then it's, yeah, it's, it's, it grazes it's the atmosphere, grazes and it's probably which be may an air cause an explosion. It's yeah. going to be an air burst. Yeah. And, and, to figure out, and it may go around, yeah. around a long oh, time before you decide where it's going to be. <laughs> okay. so that's, and now, so the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side is on the left-hand side, this was an early, very heavy target. Okay. Uh, where it was delivered many uh, five or so impactors, and it marches it marches the asteroid point in a very regular way off the off the circle of the planet. Yeah. And uh, on the right hand side, there was a late, uh, imp so uh, late less, uh, less warning time. Less warning yeah. time is a lighter target, but it still required five SLS launches to get enough mass up there so to deal a, with it. That's the new big rocket yeah, the from new, NASA. The, yeah. the space launch system or the yeah. Senate, launch Senate, system, launch. <laughs> Senate launch system <laughs> equipped with a big <laughs> rocket to, okay. uh, to kick more out. And so the, the five of these were required to, yeah. to do this do this deflection on short time scale within a year. But I think the difference is it's it's wandering around before it, it wanders actually... around a lot more. Okay. And so that plays later into That's into the, the little, into the little yeah. scenarios because when we when we start talking about this, it, 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 right, let's how, talk a real scenario here. The real scenario was the last. Uh, actually, the scenario started out every lunchtime, and and it, but the real scenario mostly focused on the last day they pulled this. So. You saw on the, the previous slide the, the red curve. This is a Chelyabinsk-like asteroid, okay. but it's bigger, noticeably bigger. It starts out being able to deliver four and a half gigatons should it hit, and then it shrinks. And so the first year it's discovered there's a 40% chance it will hit. And so in the scenario, all the world's governments just say, eh. <laughs> right, they don't worry. Yeah. 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 Eh. Right, so it, it, the next year comes around and it sharpens, and it's down uh, and now a, 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 a much higher, two thirds chance it's going to hit, and we kind of know where it's uh, going to strike across the planet, and it goes essentially a large swath from, from from the northeast of Europe through the Middle East down into the South China Sea, okay. and, and it can be anywhere in that train, and we don't know where. Mm -hmm. By the third year or so, and this is this is like seven years to impact when it's first discovered. Okay. By the third year or so, it focuses, and from the all the data, it's going to drop in the middle of the South China Sea. Okay. okay, so that's your scenario. That's that's the first scenario. So in the context of that scenario, uh, people go to the go to the computer models and, and go to the go to the database, and they try to find out. What's going to happen when you get four and a half gigatons worth of explosive power plopped into the South China Sea? Okay. So the, the, the next slide talks about that. And where it, the, the, in, in the simulation, you'll, you'll see in the slide a row of dots. And the row of dots is the actual uh, alleged track of where the asteroid might impact. Okay. Each of those doesn't represent an impact of a different asteroid, it, just, it represents one nth of the possible impacts. Essentially, okay. when you get n dots, you know, in there, you, it's, you got one chance in a hundred or whatever. How many, right. how many scatters okay. they put in I the calculation, yeah. right? right? So, but the scenario was for uh, something off that, but in the middle of the South China Sea, right. and some 80, 84 million people are now affected. The tsunami is noticeable. It's threatening a lot of infrastructure. So let's look at this. Uh, it looks like you have these bluish ripples. Yes. So those are the waves. Yes. All right. And you have this red boundary along China and, and some of these other countries. And that's the populated areas that are going to be affected by right. tsunami. Right. Okay. Primary hazard is tsunami. Yeah. Uh, there may be uh, maybe other things, but it's primary tsunami. It could be as high as 30 meters, oh. which is not a trivial tsunami. Yeah. Okay. Well, now some of these countries, like Vietnam, have a kind of flat terrain because, right. like the the right. river deltas are, are are very flat, so the the wave could travel inland right. and affect a lot of people. Right. That's true. Okay. Right. Yeah. So the 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 the, the 
working group discussions right. went back and forth mm -hmm. and back and forth. And it was decided that since there were so much high value infrastructure around here yeah. in, this, in this basin, we would try a deflection mission. We had like two or three years to mount this deflection mission and put it out there and, and do it. Okay. So a deflection mission is tried, an intercept is launched, mm -hmm. and though in the scenario, eight kinetic deflectors are sent to deal with this asteroid, and uh, it doesn't work. Okay, which can happen. It yes. doesn't work, right. at least it doesn't work well. Right. What it does is to push most of the mass off to the side, so the main body is deflected and will not hit the Earth. So. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. The boys with the toys succeeded in saving the South China Sea. But there's another mass that's still coming straight. Hasn't been deflected, and you don't know where it is, and you don't know how big it is because there's a cloud of goo around it sure. from the deflection action. Yeah. All right? So now they've got this thing in a cloud of goo. You don't know where it's going, and, and, and there's no particular... Uh, facility to put a, a, a pinger on it to send a mission to observe it because it's going behind the sun again. Oh dear. All right? <laughs> so it goes behind the sun again. You wait, you wait, you wait, and you get down to within a year or so of impact and it pops up and that's the, the next slide. All it right. pops up and it's focused right on Bangladesh. All right. Now this is a map of, of a portion Dhaka. of Bangladesh. Yeah, okay. Dhaka yeah. and the surrounding Area, right. and this is a this is a, the the actual map on the slide is an example of the kind of information you can get from the folks who model the mm. damage. Right, there is radius at which you break half the windows. There is radius of a given overpressure. You can have all kinds of things dialed out of the calculation. Yeah, and so there are two examples here. One uh, on the right is blue, I believe that's, those are, those are uh, light damage, uh, yep. wind speeds. The reds are yep. light damage and the other parts are wind speeds, apparently. I okay. don't know. And so there, these were just two potential impact points. And so oh, now the red rain, ellipse is, the red ellipse is the likely impact yes, area. Yes. Okay. So what has happened here is it, it has popped out from behind the sun and all, and now the error ellipse has focused right down in the city of Dhaka in Bangladesh, where we've got 15 million people and they're expecting an 18 megaton air burst. Oh dear, okay. okay. <laughs> and not only that, a disruption mission is launched. The nuclear disruption mission is launched, but it tries the Venus flyby, flyby doesn't work and it gets lost. So it comes right down to, you've got one week, you've got 18 megatons coming down in Bangladesh. How do you evacuate that city? Oh dear, yeah. And so this is, but it's very realistic. These are sensible possibilities given mm -hmm. our technology mm -hmm. and given where we can go. Yeah. Now I'd say there's just a political wrinkle. Uh, the fact that a human has put his mitts on this asteroid has in effect weaponized it. Uh, the Bangladeshis could take the position that this was an act of war. Well, in, indeed. I mean, uh, being a bit of a rabble rouser in my play group, yeah. that's what I said. But <laughs> well, I mean, but it, 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 indeed, it what became a, well, if it was an act of God. If it was left alone, you could an call it an. Uh, that's right. It could have been an act of God. Uh, and, but, and then, and then, right. the, then the question is: Are the people who built the deflection tools are they liable for the damage? Right. Are we going to arrange the legal legalities of this so that if you yeah. contract to deflect something? and it doesn't go right, are you liable for the damage? Oh boy. And if you were, <laughs> would anyone bother to deflect it? And then the freest argument was it's coming down in the water for heaven's sake, don't deflect at all. So in the, before, mm. before when it was coming down the South China Sea, the people in the other parts of the hit zone saying, look, it's water, we had plenty of time to prepare for the tsunami, do not deflect. We don't want you to deflect. Right. But the boys with the toys, namely us Westerners, deflected anyway. Yeah, and so uh, things became from bad to worse. But that's not all of it. The trade space I mean, that was a good example of how the trade space goes from bad to worse. Is, 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 is this was the, the Hoot Gibson effect among the astronauts? <laughs> the Hoot Gibson effect when, when uh, the, the current head of the head of NASA made a mistake simulating the show. He was he was he turned to his to his lead pilot who was Hoot Gibson, 
And uh, Hoot said to him, well, you forgot Hoot's law. What's Hoot's law? You can always make things worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's very possible that you can work with these asteroids yeah. and make things worse. Yeah. And so the, 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 there's that, the, the, small, the small rocks are numerous and we have hundreds of these things, mm -hmm. but we don't have any really ready technologies to launch right now. All right. So uh, we now mostly depend on completion of surveys, and there are a lot of intense surveys going on to try and identify where all these guys are in the, in the 10, to, 10 to 100 meter size. Yeah. And there's a lot of work to do, but that's our, that's our best effort, is, uh, best defense. If we were to have commercial asteroid mining, that would be a good place to put the technology for deflection, since they'd be up there messing with them anyway. Right. Yeah. And if you have the right protocol, you'd have the transportation and, capability. And, and, the, yeah. and that would be a natural place to put the ability to uh, to work with these things. But the other thing that one one thing I noticed in the, there was not a mission planning uh, uh, techno technology that said. Let's go out there with two or three things we're going to do rather than just one. We had a lot of people would worry about the deflection. A lot of people would worry about putting a putting a pinger on it yeah. to talk to you. But it seemed like most sensible to to bring uh, missions together that would do all three at once. Yeah. You want something to That'd to, be economical. to, to ping. Yeah. To, it's not economical because mm -hmm. they all go out at the same time. They yeah. come in in series. Mm -hmm. It's not just a matter of economics, it's a matter of effectiveness, because you have something that'll talk to you to help guide the, guide the interceptor in, mm -hmm. and then something which will observe it to let you see how, what happened, damage assessment. Okay. So without a multiple head of mission, you might not do as well. All right, well thank you very much. And that was Dr. Robert Terry uh, talking about planetary defense. Thank you, and see you next time.